and I'm gonna call a dance or an auction, I'm not self-conscious at all. Once I get out there, I am at one with the dance floor. And that's the thrill part of it. And when the music stops and everything's over and people turn around and clap, then I'm separated from everybody. Uh -huh. And that's not the enjoyable part. Yeah. I think I enjoy it because when I'm calling, the focus is really isn't on me. Right, you right. Know, it's, there, it's on each other. I'm, I'm right, just right. creating this environment uh -huh. for people to I'm part interact. I'm this crystalline structure yeah. up there, and I get to say, yeah. little tweak that structure here a little bit there. Exactly, yeah. The crystals get <laughs> even better, and you can just blur your eyes and see everything happen at once. Oh, yeah. I never got to really be a participant. Um, <clears throat> when I was little, my parents are distinctly anti-dance, probably because it, they were afraid I would fall in with older men. So I would get to go one weekend a year to, to go and help my uncle and all my cousins do the haying. That happened to be the same weekend as the folk dance festival. So my aunts would drop my cousins and me off at the festival and we'd dance all weekend. And so the whole rest of the, the year, every kid in my neighborhood had to learn each of the dances that that I brought intact home with me in my head. And they're usually three or four a year where I can remember every note of the tune, every step. I knew how to teach it. I know how to make it part of the game of circus or gangsters or whatever we were playing. It was always a part of it. And then finally when I got through, well, we had square dance calling and I'm um, square dancing in fourth to sixth grade with Bob Hager, who was a Federation caller, I think. And he just in, in Tacoma. Tacoma. In all the public schools. Mm. He's the same guy who taught my dad to tap dance at the same set of schools. Well. Yeah, the little clog dance tap routine thing, kind of New England stylish thing that my dad continued to do, like in front of the elevator or something, until he was 85. Wow. <laughs> How about that? So I, you know, I knew, kind of knew about it, but then I got to, uh, I went to college and I found out that nobody was going to tell me not to go dancing, so I got to dance four to ten hours every single day because there's all these folk dance groups and everything. So this was international folk dance that you <clears throat> that Yeah, time? and then Balkan. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that if I taught, I could get even more hours in. And then if I had a dance troupe, we had choreographies and, you know, so I took a troupe to Europe twice on big, long dance tours doing Balkan and American stuff. And then I realized that I, <clears throat> I wasn't going to be able to be in a community with where everybody spoke that language, that it was a, a foreign language that I was dancing in, even though, you know, it's my heritage too. Um, so then I started playing American music, and and everybody and nobody knew what to do. So we were playing down at the Gino Tavern with the Gypsy Gypsy String Band. We played there maybe four nights a week, and everybody's just kind of jumping up and down, yay! So it didn't take much to say circle to the left. <clears throat> And then I looked up a couple dances, like out of Lloyd Shaw or some dances that uh, somebody called at the Folk Life Festival in uh, Spokane, uh, Expo 74, yeah. Wild Bill Reagan. He Wild didn't have great Reagan. timing, but he learned from Shaw. Hmm. So there was a few of those figures fresh in my mind. I, uh, what were some of those figures? Do you remember uh, what they were? You know, Birdie in the Cage, Texas Star. Uh -huh. Um, most of the ones on the record are from Lloyd Shaw. Uh -huh. And I got eight people in my living room. Somebody called and wanted a square dance. When you play that music, they, people will call and ask for that out of the blue. That's what they associate it with. But no one was teaching square dancing, and nobody was doing it with live music. So once I realized I could say circle to the left, and they would, I mean, they always had anyway. <laughs> uh, it was kind of easy to move on and teach the whole rest of the thing. So we got eight people together in the living room, studied them up for this gig, and took them as the seed population at a, a Galloping Gertie celebration, a, some celebration of the Narrows Bridge thing of the club that was, you know, the Narrows Bridge blew down in 1942 or something. And then people started asking for squares, asking for dances. Um, and then somebody asked me to call it the Folk Life Festival. 
in 75 in D.C. And was that when you were already touring with the Gypsy Gypos? Had you started? Yeah, we were touring tours? up and down the West Coast <clears throat> from mm -hmm. about 74, 73. Yeah, 73, I think we started. And we made that record, the Gypsy mm -hmm. Gypos String Man record. Um, and we, we played really a lot. You know, we played four or five nights a week. And squares definitely added to the population that, that we could, you know, we could then do weddings, you know, where they wanted to have an organized activity or something like that. And, 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 and all this time that you had started the dances at the, the Inside Tavern? Inside Passage. Inside, yeah. Yeah, that was kind of where, it, and then where it, that happened because they were jumping around and had nothing to do. <laughs> so then it went to the G note. When was that that it, the G note started? You know, you're going to have to ask Sherry. <clears throat> I don't remember what those dates were. Some of the important things about that, about that G note experience were that the Gypsy Gypo string band had a really good fast tempo. We could keep time with each other that way. At slower tempos, we couldn't hold it together very much. So, and it was hard to get the attention of the band because they were, you know, they're a bunch of young, strapping guys and they were having a good time at, at the tavern gig, you know? And so we had to start this new idiom of, would you guys be quiet a minute and I'll, I'll tell them what to do. So the sooner I could get that across, the better. It was hard to start and stop the band because there were four guys bigger than me. And so <laughs> instead of calling single tips, I called one tip, tied another one, stuck it on there too so that we didn't have to break in between. Tried to get them to change tunes maybe at that spot, but that's when those two got stuck together in the way we do it. Ah, oh, right, okay. Um, and everybody that's out at taverns on a Tuesday night or Thursday night, you know, is probably really young and they want an excuse to expend some energy and the band was really fast and the thing that makes squares work is things like centrifugal force and partnering and you can't get there unless you use it and you, so you, you have to use it when the music's that fast. <laughs> so that's how it all kind of fit together into something that when I went back east and did it the way I only know how, you know that it was something exciting. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. <clears throat> that was a puzzle to me. I didn't, I, I thought when they called me up from Pinewoods, at your suggestion, I think, I thought they were kidding that they really had the wrong phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I also thought about, once I'd been to Pinewoods, I thought, oh man, what I really would like to do is contra dancing. Because you don't have to call the whole time and everything, but I thought, no, it would be better to keep one idiom until it has enough support around it of other people that can call it, other people that can play the music, other venues where it happens before that scene gets fragmented by another idiom that has a kind of a different following. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I was the square caller when people started calling and I could call less <clears throat> and they started calling contras, I could go to those dances and so on. So uh, I wasn't the one that, that brought contras here. Who was that? I don't know. Yeah, but they, <laughs> I don't know. Somebody else. But you used to occasionally call a contra, right? Yeah, yeah. Once things got moving along and there was enough of a kind of a core of activity. And when I go east, I'd call contras because people like that too. And 